is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. The hearing is entitled Oversight of the SEC's Division of Investment Management. And uh, I, I uh, will now recognize myself for three minutes to give an opening statement. Hardworking families in West Michigan and across the nation rely on the mar capital markets to save for each stage of life. Whether it is saving for college, home ownership, or retirement, the capital markets play an integral part in each of these milestones. In order to help more Americans achieve financial security in the future, we must continually improve our capital markets so they are as efficient as possible. By focusing on this priority, investors will have a better opportunity to receive the greatest return on their investment. Additionally, we must continue to expand access for Main Street investors and ensure that they are able to invest in a better future, not only for themselves, but for their children and grandchildren as well. Today's hearing will focus on the policies and procedures of the SEC's Division of Investment Management. The role of this division is to protect investors, promote informed decision making, and facilitate appropriate innovation in investment products and services through regulating the asset management industry. The IM division is also responsible for the Commission's regulation of investment companies, variable insurance products, and federally registered investment advisors. These types of investment companies include mutual funds, closed-end funds, business development companies, unit investment trusts, and exchange-traded funds. Over 100 million individuals representing nearly 60 million households, or roughly 45% of U.S. households, owned funds that fall under the pre purview of the Division of Investment Management. Additionally, of the over 13,000 registered investment advisors, approximately half of those advisors serve 35 million retail investor clients with over 12 trillion in retail client assets under management. Because of the significant role that the IM division plays in the capital markets, I'm pleased to see the commission is working diligently on several initiatives to improve investment options and experience for Mr. and Mrs. 401k. Main Street investors should have the tools they need in order to make informed investment decisions and build a better financial future. Now more than ever, sound financial advice has become critical for every individual looking to invest and save for their future. I was pleased that the SEC finally assumed leadership as the expert regulator and crafted regulations for the standard of care for broker-dealers and disclosures by financial professionals. Additionally, we need to modernize our current regulatory framework. Our capital markets are the envy of the world, but while we have a 21st century uh, financial marketplace, we're operating under a 20th century regulatory structure. I'm a big believer in looking at the rearview mirror in order to assess existing policies to determine whether or not they are still appropriate for today's markets. For example, the IM division made the right decision to withdraw the 2004 staff guidance letters regarding investment advisors' responsibilities in voting client proxies and retaining proxy advisory for firms in preparation for the November roundtable that will more closely examine this issue. Needless to say, I'm encouraged by the work and priorities of the SEC's Division of Investment Management, and I look forward to hearing more about how its agenda is consistent with the SEC's congressionally mandated trifold mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. So my time has expired, but the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes for an opening thank, statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. The SEC's Division of Investment Management is one of the agency's most important divisions because it regulates the asset management industry, including investment advisors, mutual funds, and exchange-traded funds, or ETFs. Mutual funds and ETFs have been growing at an incredible speed. Our mutual funds have grown from $4.4 trillion in assets in 2000 to a staggering $18.7 trillion in assets presently. And ETFs have grown from just 1.5 billion in assets in 2003 to nearly 3.3 trillion today. The Investment Management Div Division oversees more than 12,000 registered investment advisors. And these investment advisors collect collectively have over 71 trillion in assets under management. The division has taken some positive steps during Director Blass's tenure. In particular, I was pleased that Director Blass outlined a number of critical investor protection issues that mutual funds need to answer before they start holding significant amounts of cryptocurrencies. 
These are many outstanding questions about whether cryptocurrencies are appropriate investments for mutual funds, and I want to thank you for your thoughtful investor protection-focused approach on this issue. The division has also taken a couple of actions that I am concerned about. For example, earlier this month, the Investment Management Division suddenly, and without any explanation, withdrew two no-action letters from 2004 relating to proxy advisors. Proxy advisors provide recommendations to institutional investors, including mutual funds, on how to vote on board of director elections and shareholder resolutions. Mutual funds typically delegate the decision on how to vote on shareholder resolutions to the investment advisor managing the fund, because mutual funds are often shareholders at hundreds or even thousands of different public company investment advisors sometimes rely on the recommendations of proxy advisors for how to vote on these matters. The SEC had provided detailed guidance on how and when investment advisors could rely on the recommendations of proxy firms in a two no action letters in 2004. And this system had worked well for 14 years. But then two weeks ago, the SEC's Investment Management Division suddenly withdrew these two letters. The only reasons the SEC cited were unspecific, developments since 2004, and a desire to facilitate a discussion about proxy advisors at the SEC roundtable in November. Uh, this is concerning. It's unclear why the SEC needed to withdraw two no action letters that have been extensively relied upon for years in order to simply facilitate discussion about proxy advisors. Surely it was possible to have a robust discussion about this without suddenly withdrawing the guidance that the mar markets have been observing and relying on for years. And I will be very interested in this hearing what developments since 2004 necessitated the abrupt withdrawal of these two letters. In addition, in 2016, the SEC adopted a series of important rules on liquidity management for mutual funds. One of these rules would have enhanced the disclosures that mutual funds make about the liquidity, allowing investors to make more informed choices and potentially avoiding investing in funds that are riskier than the investor wants. Unfortunately, about 18 months after this rule was finalized, but before the new disclosure took effect, the SEC voted to roll back the rule by eliminating the public disclosure about funds liquidity. So I will be very interested in hearing why the SEC thinks investors are not capable of properly understanding statistics about a fund's liquidity profile. I look forward from hearing from the Director Blass about all these issues, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back, and with that, the Chair recognizes the uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Holkren, for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Heisinga, for uh, convening this hearing. Throughout this Congress, the subcommittee has made an effort to review our securities laws to identify reforms that will allow our regulators and regulatory framework to support capital formation and drive economic growth. This all culminated with the passage of the bipartisan jobs 3.0 package that's awaiting consideration in the Senate and hopefully we'll move forward sometime soon there. This review of our regulatory framework is not an endeavor uh, that can be successful without regulators who are willing to do the same. So far, I'm very pleased with the efforts put forth uh, by the Commission to review the regulatory framework and their willingness to work with Congress, industry representatives, and Main Street investors to support structure and certainty in our capital markets. Just two weeks ago, uh, your division withdrew staff uh, guidance letters issued in 2004 regarding the proxy process. I applaud this step ahead of the SEC's upcoming roundtable on the U.S. proxy process. These actions represent thoughtful engagement and consideration of how to best protect shareholders and promote transparency in our capital markets. With millions of Americans already participating uh, in our asset management industry, the Division of Investment Management plays a critical role in protecting the average retail investor from fraud and abuse as this division regulates the investment funds and advisors that interact directly with these Main Street investors. Additionally, as Congress looks for more ways to encourage people to save for retirement, it's important that this division continuously strive to promote transparency and accessibility to allow more Main Street investors to enter the markets. 
Ms. Blas, uh, I look forward to your testimony and any recommendations that you have for protecting Main Street investors as they save for retirement, their children's education, and much more. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, and with that today, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, the testimony of uh, Ms. Dahlia Blass, uh, Director of the Investment Management Division of the SEC. Uh, Ms. Blass has extensive private sector industry service, as well as serving at the SEC in a number of leadership roles within the Division of Investment Management prior to becoming Director. Uh, very pleased to see that your team behind you. you have, we have a few familiar faces. A couple of new faces, though, to that team uh, are your kids, uh, Alexander and Kathleen. Uh, who are uh, here, I believe, on an excused absence. If it's not an excused absence, have the teacher come talk to me. Um, but uh, I, just, to, just to let you guys know, the work that your mom does is very, very important. And uh, we want to say thank you to you, uh, because I know it might mean mom has to take some late-night phone calls sometimes or sometimes on a Saturday or things that are going on. But the work that she is doing is very important for our country right now, but also for the country that you guys are gonna be inheriting as well. So uh, uh, having a bunch of kids myself, I know that sometimes they're on the front end of, uh, of the challenges that the jobs that mom and dad might have. But uh, I just wanna say thank you to you and, and let you know your mom's doing an awesome job. So thanks for being here. So with that, uh, Ms. Blass, uh, you are uh, going to be recognized for five minutes, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, Chairman Heisinger, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today about the work of the Division of Investment Management. I would also would like to thank my family for their support, including my two oldest children who are seated behind me today. Um, this is a great opportunity for them to experience government at work. I am honored to serve as director of the Division of Investment Management, where I work every day with talented and dedicated staff to develop regulatory policy for the asset management industry. It is an industry that is critical to the U.S. economy and the retirement and financial needs of millions of American investors. As you said, Mr. Chairman, by way of example, as at the end of last year, over 100 million investors, individuals, representing nearly 60 million households, that's 45 percent of U.S. households, owned funds. In light of the importance of the asset management industry to investors and the markets, since my appointment as director of the division last year, we have embraced three principles that guide our efforts in developing, assessing, and implementing policy initiatives. First, improving the retail investor experience. Second, modernizing the regulatory framework and our engagement. And third, leveraging our resources efficiently. The division has been hard at work in 2018, so I'll um, just touch on a few highlights from my written testimony. Improving the, um, the retail investor experience is about assessing the information needs of and our interaction with Main Street investors. Technology has presented us new opportunities for how we provide and solicit information. With that in mind, the division is working on several initiatives to improve the investor experience. For example, earlier this year, the Commission proposed a comprehensive rulemaking package on the standards of conduct of financial professionals. The package is designed to serve retail investors by bringing the legal requirements and mandated disclosures in line with investor expectations. The package included regulation best interest, the relationship summary disclosure, and an interpretation of the investment advisor fiduciary standard. Our division led the staff's efforts on the relationship summary, which is designed to educate investors about whether they are dealing with a broker-dealer, an investment advisor, or both, and why that matters when considering the services, fees, and conflicts of the financial professional. In the proposal, the Commission sought comments on ways to optimize delivery of information to retail investors. This rulemaking has also been an opportunity to try out new ways to reach Main Street investors. We have rolled out a new website invited, inviting investors to tell us about their experience, um, developed simpler ways for investors to provide comments, and held roundtables in seven cities. This investor feedback has been valuable to the staff as we consider the comments we have received. Another example is our work to improve the design, delivery, and content of fund disclosures. Disclosure is the backbone of the federal securities laws and is a critical tool for investors when making investment decisions. With that in mind, the Commission issued a request for comment to gain insight on ways to improve and modernize fund disclosures. Moving to the second principle, modernizing our regulatory framework and engagement, the Division is working on several initiatives to help our markets grow and develop 
for the benefit of all market participants, including our Main Street investors. This includes work on an ETF rule and revisiting the role of fund boards. We're also hard at work on important initiatives, like a recommendation for adopting a rule under the FAIR Act and proposing rule changes to modernize the ways BDCs and closed-end funds are offered to the market. Finally, with respect to the third principle, we are looking at how we can employ our resources effectively and efficiently. We are a division of around 180 people responsible for policy affecting more than 20,000 registered funds and investment advisors, and an industry that is approximately $80 trillion in assets under management. Enhanced use of technology and continuous process improvements are critical to our effectiveness and our efficiency. In that regard, one of our main focuses is enhanced use of data analysis in our disclosure, oversight, and regulatory initiatives. Thank you again for inviting me to discuss the division's effort and the work of its dedicated and talented staff. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, <clears throat> at this time, uh, I recognize myself for, uh, for five minutes of questioning. Um, uh, as the ranking member had brought up as well, uh, there was uh, the uh, no action letters, uh, the two, two letters that were issued in 2014 to Institutional Shareholder Services and Egan Jones Proxy Services. Um, can you please elaborate on, on, uh, on how rescinding these letters will actually help uh, investment advisors vote in their clients' best interests and manage conflicts of interest? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so the investor advisors, um, the law has not changed. The commission adopted a rule back in 2003 with respect to vo proxy voting, and that is the basis. That, that is the, the, the foundation, if you will. Um, since that time, the, there has been the two no-action letters that were uh, interpretive letters that were issued, as well as staff guidance thereafter. Um, we have been undertaking a full review of all guidance issued by the division. This is part of our mo modernizing our regulatory framework to see which guidance should be amended, rescinded, supplemented um, as, as we look at market developments. Um, when we, and we have been doing an extensive outreach um, to issuers, to proxy advisors, to investors in this space, um, our outreach resulted in our um, determination that a roundtable to make sure that we have a forum to discuss these issues where all, all participants, all interested parties can come together and have a, a good discussion about the issues in this space because it's extremely important to investors. This is how they exercise their voice in, in the market. And, and that roundtable is scheduled for when? November 15th. Okay. Um, so looking at the, you know, our engagement led to, we need this roundtable, it's, it's a good path forward. And looking at the roundtable, we also looked back at the roundtable that we hosted back in 2013. And in that roundtable, those two letters got a lot of airtime. There are significant issues that should be discussed in the coming roundtable. So with that in mind, and also with in mind the market developments since 2004 when they were issued, we determined the best course of action would be to withdraw these two letters and discuss the, the important issues with respect to proxy okay. advice. Okay, in, in light of that, do you believe that the SEC should provide further guidance uh, what it means to be a, quote, independent third party uh, or how an investment advisor can satisfy their fiduciary duty uh, as required by the 2003 rule? That is one of the very questions that we're hoping to get information about um, during this roundtable so that we can make appropriate recommendations to the commission. Okay, well, uh, it is interesting. Uh, the two largest proxy advisory firms combined control at least 97% of the proxy advisory industry, and, and, uh, um, and, and obviously uh, they also sell services while they are uh, then uh, doing some of these reviews, and, and uh, I'm very concerned about the potential conflicts of interest on, on behalf of uh, these, these firms and the, and the folks that they're trying to uh, serve. Um, let me uh, quickly move on to exchange-traded funds, ETFs. Uh, according to the recent data by the uh, ICI Investment Company Institute, uh, ETFs contain $3.61 trillion in assets with uh, 1,923 different ETFs one of the reasons ETFs have grown so rapidly is because they offer a lower cost alternative to mutual funds. Uh, can you please elaborate on why ETFs are less costly than mutual funds and highlight other reasons that may prove to be better, uh, they may be a better alternative for investors? Um, ETFs are a, a, um, an investment company and um, they are different than mutual funds. They are open investment companies, but they're different than mutual funds. An investor can go in and out of an ETF intraday at any point in the day, they can buy and sell versus a mutual fund. 
you're bound by, um, by end of day. The structure of the ETF provides certain tax efficiencies and that provides lower cost. Um, a lot of that is due to the in-kind nature of how they transact with um, the, the primary market, the authorized participants. Um, they also has, have less um, fees and other respects as well. For example, uh, they, um, they usually don't have a load. Um, the transfer agency fees are less, or so a lot of um, you know fewer fees in, in ETFs. Well, the, and there was a uh, June 28 uh, of 17, the SEC voted uh, to propose a new rule to, to modernize the regulatory framework of ETFs. And, and I'm curious if you could explain how the proposed rule leveled the playing field. And then finally, um, uh, real quickly, last month the SEC rejected nine proposed Bitcoin ETF proposals and decided to delay the decision allowing for SIBO Bitcoin ETF. Um, do you believe that some version of Bitcoin ETF will uh, be approved in the near future, and can you speak to the pros and cons of approving or not approving uh, the, those product? So in, in June of this year, the commission proposed an, an ETF that would cover um, the ETFs that we usually see in the, in the exemptive application um, program. Uh, we have issued over 300 individual exemptive orders to um, ETF sponsors for them to launch and operate um, to, to date. Um, so a rule would create a, a, a transparent, consistent, and efficient regulatory framework for these ETFs that, you know, increasingly investors have uh, shown interest in holding these products. With respect to the, your question, with respect to the um, um, Bitcoin um, um, ETFs, those uh, are actually exchange-traded products, not exchange-traded funds. And this is something that um, I do think is important because there's market confusion when um, the term ETF is used regardless of what the product is about. An ETF is an investment company. It comes under the 40 Act and has to comply with the mandates of the 40 Act. Um, an ETP is usually a commodity pool, um, and it's a, it's a, it comes to market in the same way an operating company would come to market. These are different products, and so it's important to understand the differences. My time is well expired, so we'll have a generous grab gavel with the ranking member as well, who is recognized for five, five thank minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Director Blass, for your testimony. I'd like to ask you about the SEC's 2014 rule on money market funds. And as you know, the SEC's rule made certain money market funds that invest in corporate and municipal debt more transparent by requiring them to tell investors the fund's true market-based value every day, known as a floating net asset value, or NAV. Uh, this is designed to take away the first mover advantage that gives the investor an incentive to be the first one to withdraw their money, which is what leads to devastating investor runs that can destabilize the entire market. So I think that this was one of the most important uh, post-crisis uh, uh, reforms that we made. The rule has now been in effect for about two years, so my question to you is, have you seen any major problems in money market funds since the rule came into effect that would necessitate major changes to the SEC's 2014 rule? Um, the rule was adopted back in 2014. Um, the commission at the time adopted the, the, the reform package for money funds to address, it was designed to address certain structural risks uh, presented by money funds um, since their inception. Um, ultimately, as to your question about whether any change is um, necessary, that would be a, a decision um, of the commission. Mm -hmm. We on the staff, we monitor money market funds daily. Mm -hmm. um, we monitor them pretty closely. Um, during the implementation, we did see a, a, a significant shift in assets from prime funds into government funds, um, a, a shift to the tune of over $1 trillion. Um, we have and we will continue monitoring uh, money funds as well as our short-term funding markets to see how they evolve within our regulatory framework. Um, now, we do know that certain, um, there, certain people believe that further changes um, may be necessary um, or are necessary with respect to money funds. I will note that our doors are always open. Um, we're happy to engage and hear their perspectives. Okay, uh, on, on the uh, no action letters, the SEC simply said that it had decided to withdraw the letters because, quote, developments since 20, 2004. So I, I just would like to know exactly uh, what were the developments since 2004 that made it necessary to just withdraw these two letters. Um, so the, the commission adopted the rule for, pro for proxy voting um, towards the end of 2003. Since that time, 
investment advisors have had experience with how to develop policies and procedures to address conflicts. They have a better sense of what those conflicts are. The market has also um, changed significantly. Back then, um, the assets of the asset management industry was um, just about seven and a half trillion dollars. Um, at this point, it's well over $20 trillion. That's just the registered um, fund assets. Um, the passive investing has also grown tremendously since that time. The regulatory landscape for, for those proxy advisors has also changed. Technological changes in data analysis and gathering has also been very significant in that time. There have been a lot of market developments in that time. What hasn't changed, that this is, and, and you mentioned it in your opening statement, is this is about fundamentally about how shareholders exercise their rights. This is about shareholder rights. And the proxy firms are a, a very important part of this e ecosystem, if you will. We wanted to focus on discussing these issues, which are really important to shareholders in the upcoming roundtable, to see what changes, if any, should be made since the adoption by the Commission of the rule in 2003. Given how much airtime, um, whether rightly or wrongly, these, um, these two letters have received, we determined the best course of action to make sure that we get um, robust discussion in the roundtable would be to withdraw these two letters. Well, I'd like to uh, follow up by asking, you mentioned that the 2014 legal bulletin on proxy advisors remains in effect, right? So do you believe that the guidance in this bulletin is effectively identical to the two 2004 letters that you withdrew, meaning that nothing of uh, SEC's uh, sub substan substantive guidance on proxy advisors has actually changed? Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say those, the letters are identical to the staff legal bulletin, and I, um, the, the staff legal bulletin is closer um, to what the Commission said with respect to the investment advisor's fiduciary duty and duty to monitor, fiduciary duty, it is a fiduciary with respect to its duty to monitor um, the pro use of proxy advisory firms. Um, and um, I, I will note that the staff legal bulletin in the staff statement we put out with respect to the withdrawal, we did note that we expect to discuss the staff legal bulletin in the roundtable. My time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, with that, the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as well as thank you. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, in my opening statement, I mentioned uh, my appreciation for the SEC's willingness to review current regulations and engage with uh, Congress, investors, and industry regarding reforms to fit today's capital markets. Just recently, the SEC reinforced this idea with the announcement of a staff roundtable on the proxy process in November. Additionally, just two weeks ago, your division withdrew two no-action letters from 2004 that were issued to proxy advisory firms. Your testimony states that uh, these were revoked as part of the preparation for the roundtable. I wondered, is this intended to allow for a more complete consideration of the proxy process as it stands today compared to 2004 when the letters were issued? Um, that is what we hope to have in the roundtable, a fulsome discussion of all aspects of the proxy process. Okay. Understanding that this uh, roundtable is still to come, do you believe that rescinding these letters will bring more transparency and accountability to the proxy voting process? And is there further guidance that you already anticipate will be needed? Um, I think it's important for us um, to use the roundtable to get better information about the state of play, the market developments, um, how proxy advisors are being used. I can go on down the list. That's what the roundtable is about, so we can get this information, can have folks in a transparent fashion talk together about you know, where to see the play is, and then we can make appropriate recommendations to the commission. Great. In July, I sent a letter to the financial regulators with responsibility for the Volcker rule, requesting that they reconsider the definition of covered funds so that it excludes venture capital. As my le letter stated, uh, the congressional record clearly demonstrates through a colloquy between Senator Boxer and then Chairman Franks that investing in venture capital was never intended to be prohibited by the Volcker rule when Section 619 was drafted by Congress. Additionally, in July, when Chairman Powell came before this committee, I asked him about this issue, and he stated that these activities are not a threat to safety and soundness. I understand that the comment period is still open on this issue. However, I would like to pose a hypothetical to you. Say that a bank-controlled covered fund, uh, con excuse me, a bank-controlled covered fund and a venture capital firm have an agreement on a $200 million investment into a startup company owned by the venture capital fund. However, the venture capital fund says they would prefer to have the fund make an investment into a credit or debit instrument instead of an equity instrument. 
Based around the current construct, the bank fund would not be allowed to invest unless the company was willing to sell an equity piece of the company. Why should it be the Volcker rule? Why should it be that the Volcker rule should differentiate between credit investments and equity investments? And why should a bank be allowed to lend through its own balance sheet, but not through a fund? Um, we do appreciate um, that the definition of covered funds is both um, over-inclusive and under-inclusive in some circumstances, um, and that there have been implementation challenges with the definition of covered funds. That is why we have the request for comment out. I believe the comment period closes mid-October, and we do, and we did ask a lot of questions in that regard, and we look forward to seeing um, commenters' um, thoughts and opinions about this. Great, we're looking forward to some clarity as well on it, so uh, looking forward to resolution there. Finally, uh, as you know, the standard of care that governs personal, personalized investment has been a widely debated issue before this committee and across the asset management industry. I'm pleased that the SEC has stepped in following the rule by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that nullified the DOL fiduciary rule. I believe that the SEC is better suited to regulate the standard. I've been following uh, the regulation best interest rulemaking process. During this process, some commenters expressed concern about the proposed form CRS. How do you plan to incorporate the feedback you received through the comment process on that? Um, thank you for the question. We have received thousands of comment letters. I think they're north, north of 6,000 at this point. Um, we've also had um, investor roundtables. Uh, we've had the Tell Us campaign, so investors can um, submit comments directly into the comment file through our, the, the feedback form that we have on the Tell Us page, and they have uh, been doing so. So we've received, and we've also had third parties um, 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 perform investor testing and submit these uh, results into the comment file. We have a lot of great comments, and the staff is going through it to see what what changes, what recommendations um, should be made to the to the form, what changes should be made to the form, so we can make recommendations to the commission. Thank you, Director Blass. I'll yield back the last uh, 30 seconds to the chairman if he has any other questions or just yield back my time. It is an efficient day at the committee. Well, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Sherman from California is recognized for five minutes. Uh, first, I have a comment about cryptocurrencies, and I'll go into three questions. Cryptocurrencies are either an investment or a medium of exchange. To the extent they're a medium of exchange, they undermine the power of the federal government. We get uh, signerage which is a huge profit center for the U.S. government. If the dollar wasn't used around the world, we wouldn't get it. Second, uh, we have lower borrowing costs. And third, our sanctions policy around the world can bite because the U.S. dollar is the medium of exchange. There is a libertarian, almost anarchist philosophy out there that says disempower the U.S. federal government. Uh, as part of the U.S. federal government, I disagree. But you deal with investments. And if there was an investment vehicle that wanted to register that invested in nothing but illegally issued securities, uh, publicly traded securities that had never been registered, violations of every state and federal law, I don't think you'd say, well, you can register a security whose assets consist exclusively of illegally issued securities. Uh, 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 cryptocurrencies are, if they are investment vehicles, illegally issued securities. Uh, they're an investment vehicle with none of the investment protection. So I hope that you would do everything possible uh, to stop uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and investments based on them, not to mention the billions that have been lost by various investors. Uh, now for questions. Uh, I want to congratulate the SEC on uh, advancing Rule 30E-3, which uh, modernized the default method for shareholder reports. Uh, you're saving $2 billion over the next 10 years and 2 million trees. Uh, what more can the uh, SEC do to reduce the clutter that builds up on my desk as I get these on paper and to save the trees? Um, thank you for the question. We've actually um, launched the in Investor Experience Initiative um, to broadly look at all fund disclosures and what we can do to improve the design, delivery, and content. Um, so not just how we deliver the documents mm -hmm. or the disclosure, but what we can do to make the disclosure um, move into the 21st century, um, to make use of modern technology, to provide it to investors in a way that they could assimilate the, the disclosure mm -hmm. so that they can make the informed investment decisions. And, and an advantage there, if it's delivered electronically, you could require to have a link in there. So I click here and I see some other document. Um, you can use layered disclosure. Um, whether you use paper or you use um, electronic delivery, you can use layered disclosure to provide better information to investors. Yeah. 
works better electronically. Uh, I hope you'll save as many trees as possible. Um, and I think it's actually better for investors because when I get it on paper, I lose it. When I get it electronically, you know, six to uh, I get some extra time two weeks later, I can look it up and see on my iPad. Not that I would fail to pay attention to what's going on in these hearings. Um, uh, I've uh, opposed legislation that would undo the SEC's 2014 money market reforms. Uh, these reforms were put in place uh, to increase transparency. Uh, do you share the concerns of Chairman Clayton that making major changes to these reforms would be disruptive of uh, the, in particular, uh, the, insti the uh, money market funds that uh, invest in corporate debt and are held by institutional investors? So I, I will let the chairman um, speak for himself. Um, I, I, I do believe that he was um, acknowledging um, the shift in assets that I mentioned, the one point trillion um, dollars, over one point tri um, trillion dollars that shifted from the prime funds into the government funds. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, putting aside the merits of the rule or that outcome, um, we should um, always carefully um, consider the impacts of su such shifts on investors and the markets. Um, I hope we, uh, uh, well, I'm going to move on to the third question and final one. Uh, in 2014, the S&P and Russell removed business development companies from their various stock indexes. I spent a lot of time in this room. We're all dedicated to providing capital to small businesses. Um, but the reason uh, they did this is over concerns that disclosure rule of the index funds uh, overall expense ratio. Given that the costs uh, incorporated into an index fund's expense ratio under this disclosure rule uh, when it makes an investment in a business development company are not additional expenses of the index fund. What steps is the SEC sta uh, staff taking to look at the negative impacts of this, uh, in effect, double counting of expenses uh, and uh, the negative effect it has on capital for small business? Um, I believe you're referring to the acquired fund fees and expenses, which the Commission adopted back in 2006 to provide transparency to investors with respect to fund-to-fund uh, -fund investments. Um, we are aware of the, of the issue with respect to business development companies. Um, there's been extensive engagement, and I believe there is an application, exemptive application, now on file, which the staff is working on. I hope you move forward with that, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, with that, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I want to follow up on a question that Mr. Sherman just asked, just to make sure um, I understand. So obviously, the, um, the SEC's acquired fund fee rule, uh, fund fee and expense rule, um, has had a negative impact on a lot of business development companies that have faced potential delisting from some indices and other things. And as you probably know, uh, BDCs are not a passive investment. They are much more like a REIT, uh, and they deserve the same kind of consideration like a REIT with regard to the, the, uh, the AFFE. Uh, it, do you think that that's something you guys would be willing to look at, and do you see those as similar investment tools with the same kind of operating costs and expenses that could maybe drive an artificial number on the AFFE that could cause problems for uh, the BDCs that want to be listed? And would you be willing to look at maybe some type of uh, exemption from the AFFE similar to what REITs have? Um, so as I mentioned, this was a rule that was adopted by the commission back in 2006. And actually, I happen to um, have been the staff attorney that uh, worked on, on, on that rule. Um, Great. Um, the, at the time um, when the rule was adopted, um, BDC assets were, were significantly they were nothing almost. Smaller. Rounded to zero, yes. Um, maybe not zero, but um, Rounded pretty to close. Zero. Um, yes. And we actually did not receive any input um, from BDCs at the time, no highlight of this issue that you're raising. Um, since then, um, there has been outreach. They have raised um, this, this particular issue, um, and they have filed a, a request for an exemption um, from, the, from this provision with the, with the division, and that is being um, actively reviewed by the staff. Great. I appreciate your review on it. I think it's um, having a negative impact on an investment that allows a lot of Main Street folks to uh, be able to participate in um, middle market companies 
and thing, investments that they haven't had access to. Only uh, accredited investors have normally had access to those type of uh, investment vehicles where they can share in the upside of the growth of businesses, uh, and it's a very big deal. And uh, it also funds Main Street jobs, so I think it's a big deal for our economy. It's a great opportunity for Main Street investors, and it's just a different type of investment than a passive investment. So I appreciate your willingness uh, to consider that, and, and that's all I had. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, welcome, Director. Uh, in a letter this summer to the SEC commissioners, our uh, Secretary of State, uh, Bill Galvin, uh, in Massachusetts, asserted in its best interest proposal, the SEC was simply offering a weak and somewhat vague uh, standard that, unless modified, would force Massachusetts to adopt its own rules to protect investors and require broker-dealers to provide non-conflicted advice that puts the investor's interests ahead of the broker's interests in compensation. Uh, Secretary Galvin also contends that the proposal merely prevents a veneer of a fiduciary standard and that would allow uh, existing weaknesses in, fin in FINRA's uh, suitability standard uh, to persist. Uh, what are your, what are your uh, responses to the concerns that, and, and, and by the way, I, I agree with, uh, with Secretary Galvin. He's been very uh, vigilant on, on behalf of uh, consumers, especially financial consumers. Uh, what are your uh, responses to his concerns? Um, thank you for the question. Um, if I may, I just want to start by recognizing um, my colleagues in the Division of Trading and Markets who led our, the staff's efforts with respect to developing the recommendation and regulation best interest. So without stepping into their turf too much, I'll offer you my perspective. Um, what, what the proposal um, does is it took the principles um, from the investment advisor fiduciary standard, the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. It looked at the principles in the, DO, in the DOL fiduciary um, rule, the impartial conduct standards. Taking these principles, it tailored the principles to the broker-dealer relationship, a model, and to, to preserve that model. This was important um, to, uh, to provide, continue providing choice um, to investment advisors, uh, to the, to the uh, choice to investors in the markets with respect to commission accounts. Um, what we did notice, um, after the DOL fiduciary um, rule went into effect is that we did see a reduction in these commission-based uh, accounts. That, was, um, th that impacted the choice of investors. So while we were looking at these principles and wanted to make sure these principles moved over, were applied to the broker-dealer model, we did it in a way we tailored it to preserve that choice um, for the retail investor. <clears throat> you suggest that there's, there's some harmony there, but you know, we passed the Dodd-Frank Act, and I think it was Section 913, uh, says that uh, the investment uh, in regarding the standard of conduct for brokers, mm -hmm. in, in that we put language in there that said that the, the standard must be no less stringent than the fiduciary standard under the Advisors Act. And clearly, uh, it's not, I mean, I understand that the court uh, overruled us in that effort, but uh, there's still statutory language that, that insists that the standard be no less stringent. And uh, I think having a best interest standard, which is clearly less, uh, less exacting than the fiduciary standard, uh, we fail to, to, to meet that that obligation that's set forward in, in the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, I mean, do you concede that, that that's a gap now, that there's a delta between what we were hoping for in, in uh, Dodd-Frank and what we're, what we're receiving now under, under the SEC's rule? Um, as part of the Commission's uh, um, uh, proposed rulemaking package, uh, um, the Commission also put out a proposed interpretation of the investment advisor fiduciary standard. Um, I believe when you um, look at the, the standard as outlined, the federal fiduciary standard, and you look at regulation best interest, um, you will see core principles that are the same. 
for example, and um, neither an investment advisor and a broker dealer must act in the best interest of the customer, the retail customer. So the, the principles, the core principles are the same. They were tailored in regulation best interest to apply to the broker dealer model. All that, you know, I think it's also important to keep in mind, this is a, uh, a proposal. We have received north of 6,000 letters, comment letters to this proposal, and we are in the process of going through these comments um, to see what changes, if any, we should be recommending up to the commission. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answer, and I hope that you do, uh, you know, take those uh, comments uh, seriously and, and try to hew to the, uh, uh, the, the stricter standard to protect investors. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, is recognized for five minutes. I thank minutes. the chair, and I thank uh, Ms. Blass for being here today. Appreciate your testimony. I've got a couple of uh, areas that I'm going to try and focus on. First, uh, last month, uh, Chair Clayton announced that the SEC is working on a concept release to explore, quote, broader access to investing in privately held companies, uh, among other things. Can you walk me through the role that the Division of Investment Management has in developing this concept release? Um, I, I'll, so the, in my division, um, the, you know, we have private funds and we have registered funds, and that's a sort of a statutory distinction, if you will. Um, we, we have had um, some um, requests to see how we can um, expand some of these opportunities, for example, by way of registered funds investing more in, in private funds. Um, we work with folks um, who are interested in this. Our doors are always open to hear their perspectives. Um, ultimately, we balance investor protection with making sure that we are also looking to see in what ways we can provide more opportunities for investors, for retail investors. Are, but are you, is your division working on this concept release? Um, this, um, this would impact our division, so we would be working closely with other divisions who are also at the, um, at the, at the center of this, if you will. Okay. Uh, and I think you've already uh, covered uh, with the chair's questions uh, the issue about, uh, well, I guess I'd ask it this way, because uh, he was asking about ETFs earlier. Uh, as the director, would you be willing to spend time and resources to consider ways for Main Street investors to benefit from private equity investments via e ETFs or other investment vehicles, particularly if this helps uh, provide capital to smaller uh, and innovative companies. So as I, uh, as I mentioned, the, it's, it's a statutory delineation between private and, and, and public. Um, that said, we do have requests to see how that could be expanded, and we always welcome people's thoughts. Our doors are open, and we're happy to work with them as long as we balance the investor protection with the, with the opportunities, if you will. Got it. Uh, shifting gears to proxy advisors. In the SEC's view, why is there so little competition in the proxy advisory industry? Um, so the, 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 the proxy advisory industry is really um, high volume, low margin. Um, and with that, economies of scale kick in, and that's how you get um, the few numbers um, at hand. There are about five proxy advisory firms, with two being the, the majority in the market. And I do believe it's just economies of scale. Well, it, it, do you uh, believe that the SEC uh, uh, needs to step in to correct what is a distortion? Because uh, clearly, you don't want uh, it concentrated in just a few. I would imagine it'd be much better, despite the low margin, high volume, uh, much better if you had uh, many different choices uh, out in the marketplace. Is this something that you think the SEC should step in and, and examine and try to try to cure? Um, if I may, I will offer um, a couple of points on this, and this would be from the perspective of investment management, because I, I do know that you know um, proxy plumbing in general is, is a bigger issue or a, a broader issue. Um, first, um, with respect to proxy voting, um, the investment advisor is the fiduciary. Um, the investment advisor is the one that's tasked with voting in the best interest of its client. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is um, these are issues, the ones you raise, 
have been raised over time, and that is one of the reasons why we're having the roundtable. We want to have this discussion, we want to understand the market better, and we want this to be done in a transparent public forum so that we can get the views of as many um, interested parties as possible, including, I should mention, that there is a comment file that's already open for people to submit their viewpoints um, um, at, any, at any point at this point, at, you know, from today onwards. I, it may be, maybe I'm uh, beating it too, too much, but uh, just very quickly in the couple of seconds I have left, beyond the round table, I, how is the SET, SEC and your division uh, reviewing uh, in any way the state of competition, transparency, policies, uh, and conflicts of interest among proxy advisory firms? Um, so we actually have done uh, with colleagues from the Division of Corporation Finance um, and other and uh, colleagues from the Office of the Chief Accountant for the Commission. We have been doing extensive outreach. Uh, we've reached out to uh, investors, to registered funds, uh, their ad advisors, um, to the proxy advisory firms. Um, so we've done outreach in this area, and it actually it was this outreach that led us down the path to a roundtable, so we can have this broad public. Um, Forum to discuss all these issues. Thank you. My time's expired. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, with that, uh, gentleman from Arkansas, uh, Mr. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Davidson is here. Sorry, uh, that gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Hi. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks for your prior comments on ETFs involving cryptocurrencies. Uh, and you know, I, I take it uh, from the fact that the SEC has deemed Bitcoin to be a uh, commodity, not a security. Uh, that's why you're calling it a product. Is that accurate? Well, it, it depends on how the fund, what the fund holds. Um, there is a test under the Investment Company Act, and mm -hmm. 40, at least 40 percent of the fund's portfolio should be investment securities, and then they would become under the Investment Company Act. Okay, so is that what, what, what other criteria would lead you to call it a product instead of uh, a fund? Uh, so an ETF versus an ETP. So um, when I look at ETFs, um, I, uh, you know, I think of them as investment companies that meet the definition of investment company under the Investment Company Act. Okay. So it's the, it's the portfolio, it's the composition of the portfolio. Okay, so uh, I guess in the sense that um, there's been an ongoing effort to create these, that an ETF that involves cryptocurrencies uh, or uh, some form of token, um, has the SEC come up with guidance, or you know, I think the concern for the industry is is that we're we're getting regulation by enforcement or regulation by rejection in this case, uh, but it's kind of hard to discern what actually would meet the criteria. Do you have something like that in the works? Uh, we do. Um, so th the investment company, since its inception in 1940, it's an it's a it's a very innovative act. It's very flexible. It has allowed a lot of innovation, including ETFs in general. Um, we. Th Several sponsors are interested in offering um, exchange for the funds um, that would hold crypto-related assets. Um, we are engaging with these sponsors to make sure that our engagement is as broad and as transparent as possible. Back in January, we issued a letter um, to the ICI mm -hmm. and SIFMA AMG, and that letter is, and our, no, we have a website now right. that has the letter, and we are, um, any comments, we encourage um, um, the comments to come in on this public uh, website so that we can have um, a transparent dialogue and bring different viewpoints in. That letter highlighted the issues that these sponsors should consider um, before they are able to offer these um, um, funds to the market. At this point in time, um, believe it or not, even though we issued it in January, they are just starting now to come back to us with responses. Okay, uh, so thanks for that. We'll link, uh, certainly so by all means, look at the, if you're concerned about this issue, look at the January of 2018 letter and provide comment to the SEC. Uh, and then I think the other part is, is one of the biggest challenges uh, that's been highlighted with, with uh, cryptocurrencies or digital tokens uh, of, of a broader range is custody. Um, what custody issues do you see? Do you, uh, ways to resolve that? Uh, or concerns w that it may not be able to be addressed? Wh where, where is the SEC uh, thinking about it with respect to custody? Yep. So we did raise in the letter the custody issues, whether, for example, there would be a qualified custodian. 
Um, and at this stage, we have had um, some good, good outreach, uh, folks are, who are considering how to structure um, in, in a manner that would be compliant with our rules. Um, at, at yeah, so I, I get that, but you know, the whole premise of a distributed ledger is uh, there's a record. And it's, frankly, it's not just a record in one place, it's a record all over the planet. Uh, and it's not just available to the SEC, uh, it's available to the consumer. And frankly, anyone can look and, and say, this is, the, this is the address. So I think the concern so far, is, particularly with respect to things that aren't really securities that the SEC is looking at as uh, you know, part of a bundle, uh, the underlying asset may not be a security, but it's in a fund, so uh, the SEC has oversight there. Uh, if you look at the custody of it, you're going through a path to create a duplication of effort to say, uh, we have to find a way to tag something that already has a ledger to say who owns this account. It'd be like saying, no, really, really, who owns this Fidelity account? Well, Fidelity already shows you this is the owner. Now, we're going to pay a third party to tell you that this is the person that owns the Fidelity account. But on a massive number of levels, because it would be every token or every coin in the case. So uh, is there a way that can address that without adding a third party and just using the ledger? I, I, I appreciate um, your, your concerns and, and the question. Um, so and, is, and the, the promise um, of blockchain uh, and distributed ledger technology and what it could mean not just in the custody space but broadly in the asset management space, um, you know, what it could do and that ultimately would go to the benefit of Main Street investors. Right. It would eliminate a lot of intermediaries and it would benefit the, the investor and the consumer. Uh, yes, there is the promise of that technology. Where we are at this stage is having that conversation of here is our law um, and this is the product you want to offer. What are the issues and how can we marry the two together? So that's the conversation we're having. Our, the, in, the federal securities laws, um, you know, the investment company, as I mentioned, adopted back in 1940, look at the innovation in asset management space since 1940. Amazing products have come to markets, um, different products have come to markets that provides opportunities for retail investors. That's always happened since 1940. So with that, this is uh, a new flavor. Yeah, still a 1940 act that needs updated. My time has expired. I could talk for much longer. Thank you, Chairman. And I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, with that, uh, the gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes. Thank the Chairman. Appreciate you holding this hearing, and it's always terrific to have uh, Director Blass, back before the committee, she brings uh, all of her knowledge and intellectual power to this committee, and we need it. We need it desperately. So uh, thanks for representing the commission. Uh, last Congress, uh, was it was a pleasure to work with uh, Dr. Foster and uh, complete the work on our ETF research bill, H.R. 910. It was a bipartisan, bicameral effort to improve research available to individual investors who are using exchange-traded exchange funds, which have proliferated since 2000. And I would uh, echo your comments about the 40 Act. That, that product is a, an example of a product that was innovated under the Act without really amending the 40 Act itself. And uh, uh, think of all the people benefited by that. So uh, thank you for your leadership in this area. On May 23rd, you issued uh, the notice for the rulemaking under H.R. 910, uh, or 910, and comments were due in, I think, in early July. So when do you expect the final rulemaking to be completed on research for exchange-traded funds? Um, so um, the comment period, as noted, uh, closed at the uh, beginning of July, July 7th, I believe. Um, the staff um, has looked through the comments um, and um, has worked through our recommendations, and we hope to get that to the commission in the near future. Thank you, and you, you also, this summer, you've been busy on ETFs, uh, so you also have uh, participated in a roundtable that we had under our chairman's direction and talk about how to uh, both make sure consumers have information but also uh, have uh, markets readily accept new ideas for ETFs, and you've proposed to innovate that space. How do you think your rule that you proposed in June will aid the commission in I guess, uh, time to market for new exchange-traded fund ideas. Um, so for a sponsor to, um, a new sponsor to launch an exchange-traded fund at this point, they would still have to go through the exemptive application process. 
um, even with a, a, a plain vanilla, um, you know, ETF as we call it, um, it still takes um, even if a, a few weeks. The notice period alone is about a month. That is time to market. Um, even if you put aside the process, um, the operating under ex the exemptive, um, you know, rubric, if you will, we are today over 300 exemptive orders. Um, that creates um, inconsistencies, an unlevel playing field. And an investor investing in an ETF, they would not know that their ETF may have differences in their exemptions from another ETF. They just think of it as an ETF. So the, what the proposal is uh, seeking to do, is designed to do, is create a transparent, effective, and efficient regulatory framework for a, a segment of the asset management industry that is now $3.6 trillion and, and growing. Significantly. And on that subject of, of ETF as a term, you gave a speech recently where you were expressed some concern over the nomenclature of an ETF, what is one and what isn't one. Would that be contained in the same rule and what's your general intent there? We did um, um, request comment on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at products um, outside and the ETF is used and it could be a commodity pool, it's, it's not an ETF. Um, in some cases, I've, no, I've seen um, the financial press refer to an exchange-traded note as an ETF. Mm -hmm. um, and th this creates market confusion, and investors do not understand, would not understand what it is exactly they're buying. Um, so we did request comment on this issue, and we are um, looking forward to seeing um, what, what folks give us. Good, I think that's important because they're not all the same, and I think some uh, creating a, a design where consumers can easily put them in the proper bucket when they're considering their investment suitability would be helpful. In the time I have remaining, uh, I was uh, looking back at uh, the investment management decision to implement Volcker, and uh, I was, it seemed to me that uh, it was, your interpretation has treated it differently, whether it's an equity investment or a debt or a note investment, and isn't that interposing the uh, SEC between the corporate finance, between a company owner and a p prospective investor, shouldn't those be equally treated, whether it's an equity investment or a debt investment? Um, I appreciate the, the concerns and, and the question, and I appreciate all the implementation challenges mm -hmm. um, that have been raised. Um, the, ag the agencies, the Volcker agencies, if you will, um, did put out a rule proposal. Um, on the covered fund definition, we have a significant amount of questions out there in our request for comment. Um, and ultimately, the, our goal with this is hopefully to streamline um, the, the, the obstacle, the implementation challenges. And we do have questions that um, in, in the proposal that go to your... Um, I appreciate that. My time's expired. It speaks to why we need bicameral solution for this Volcker rule. It's complex to have harmonization between the regulatory agencies. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. And Gentleman makes an excellent point. With that, uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Director Blass. Great to have you here, and great to have your, your family, your children with you. And I think it may have been mentioned earlier, but we will provide notes for school teachers if needed. Absolutely. So um, we really appreciate your service. I want to start with some concerns I have with covered funds uh, section in the recent Volcker uh, NPR. And um, I think my friend from Michigan, Mr. Holtgren, touched on this earlier, but I want to echo those concerns. In my view, the current definition of covered funds under the rule is too broad and include funds that, uh, that engage in long-term investing and lending, which are already activities that banks can do directly. However, they aren't uh, able to do so indirectly through a fund, which are far less risky than on-balance sheet lending. It doesn't seem to make sense to capture these types of activities under a rule that was designed to prohibit short-term speculative trading activity. So I asked Chairman Powell when he was here, and I wanted to get your view as well this morning. So how will you revise the funds portion of the notice of proposed rulemaking so that these types of activities are no longer swept into the rule, so that startups and small businesses can receive the much needed capital and loans from banks to grow their businesses? Thank you for the question. Um, so the request for comment is, is out there, and the agencies look forward to receiving um, um, information about this and other aspects of the covered fund definition that have raised questions. Um, with respect to the long-term versus short-term investments, if I may offer, um, I do appreciate the concerns raised by banks that they can do this directly under the merchant banking authority um, and they cannot under, um, you know, the, the, through a fund under the, under the Volcker rule. Um, 
two things about, you know, we, we do want to ease, um, com ease compliance, um, but th there are two things, if I, if I may, for, for your consideration. One is um, the Volcker rule um, includes private equity funds, just the, the, de the term private equity fund. And private equity funds invest in both short-term and long-term investments. And then when you look at the, um, in the Volcker rule, this is statutory, not the rule, the, 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 the statute, the, um, there, it covers the illiquid funds. Um, and when you look at that one, that also includes long-term investments, um, which um, could be read as an intent of Congress to cover um, long-term investments and not just short-term. That said, we do appreciate the concerns raised in this area, and we do have the request for comment out. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, so I also want to uh, ask some follow-up questions on proxy advisors, but I, I think that's been covered already. So I want to switch over to crypto for a moment. So I'm leading a letter this week with, uh, to Chairman Clayton asking the SEC to clarify the criteria used to determine when offers and sales of digital tokens should be properly considered investment contracts and therefore offerings of securities and properly clarify what makes an offer a non-security or a commodity. So the reason I'm, I'm doing this is so that not all tokens are securities and treating all tokens as securities harms American innovation and leadership in the cryptocurrency space. So I want to ask you, Director Blass, in your view, um, are there any benefits to investing in cryptocurrencies? Um, so in my role as um, a member of the staff and director of this division, um, what I look at is um, the product that a sponsor wants to offer, um, the law, and um, work with that sponsor to see what issues are under the law and work with them to see, um, provide guidance, um, um, listen to their perspectives, um, that's what we do. And keeping in mind um, our mission, uh, which is to investor protection, uh, capital formation, and fair and orderly markets. So that's our, the umbrella we work under, and what we do is work with the sponsor, keeping in mind our regulatory infrastructure. Thank you for your engagement there. It's so critical that we in this country are on the forefront of this, so uh, it means a lot. Um, I want to ask you um, also, do you think that cryptocurrencies have the potential to help foster greater innovation and provide more investment choices for investors? When I look at the cryptocurrency space, I actually look at the blockchain, the technology, mm -hmm. the blockchain mm -hmm. technology, the distributed ledger technology, and um, I, I do understand that asset managers and others in the financial services industry are looking at that technology to see how they can bring it um, in-house, and ultimately that could really be to the benefit of Main Street investors. Um, we would, we are, in, um, our doors are always open. Uh, we would love to hear uh, about what they're doing, how they're doing, and what obstacles there are out there. But that's technology that we're definitely very interested in. I appreciate you drawing the distinction between the, the currencies and the numerous currencies out there and the technology that underlies it. So thank you so much. I want to appreciate you and, and thank you for joining us today. And I, I yield back to the chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, seeing no other uh, uh, further questions, uh, we would like to uh, say thank you to the uh, uh, to our witness today, uh, Ms. Blass, and uh, her special guests. Um, might not have been the most exciting day for you. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms. We call that the alphabet soup of uh, of government. Uh, lots of uh, lots of letters all attached to it. Uh, but again, I just want to say thank you for your, for what you uh, do and your family. And uh, this, is, uh, this is important stuff, and uh, we, uh, we, we really appreciate your time. Um, so with that, um, I would like to uh, um, allow, sorry, i got to get back on script here. Without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit additional written uh, questions uh, for the witness to the chair, and uh, then we will then forward those to the witness and, and uh, look forward to your response and just ask, that it uh, be uh, responded as promptly as you are able to. Uh, and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record as well. So again, Ms. Blass, uh, thank you for your, uh, your time and your expertise, and uh, we look forward to working with you more in the future. With that, our hearing is adjourned.